Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming to our session, which is career exploration, teacher-led or Gen Z-led. I'm Ashley Hemi. I'm the Director of Corporate Social Responsibility at American Student Assistance, and I'm excited to be the moderator here today of this panel. ASA is a national nonprofit uh, dedicated to changing the way that middle and high school students learn about careers and post-secondary options. We do this in a, a variety of different ways, through philanthropy, through advocacy efforts, through research, through digital uh, platforms to reach students directly on their phones. And through this way, we reach students all over the country. From our research, we have learned that career exploration in schools work. It's really in, in, uh, crucial for students to learn about careers, gain experiences, uh, meet professionals, and schools are a really great vehicle to do that. But there's a lot of complications to that. Some challenges with scalability of programs across the country, which leads to access and equity issues and questions that, that many of us are tackling with. At ASA, at ASA we also believe in uh, digital direct-to-student uh, technology and initiatives. Uh, what we've learned is Gen Z craves agency in their learning and wants some sort of power. They want to be empowered to make decisions about their own learning. And through technology, where you can reach students right on their computer or on their phones, there's a way for students to access that uh, directly. It leads to a lot more access across the country. At ASA, we've reached over 12 million students through our digital platforms. So I'm also personally really excited about this conversation. Before coming to ASA, I've been at ASA for about four years now, I was a middle grades teacher. So I was able to experience the uh, kind of appeal to learning in the classroom and learning about careers, but then in this kind of nonprofit space, working with organizations that are doing really good for students in technology as well. And so we're really gonna talk about this dichotomy of in and out of the classroom what that kind of relationship looks like, where career exploration belongs. Is it in the classroom, out of the classroom, or is it a little bit of both? And so uh, I'm excited here with this phenomenal group of panelists who do work both in and out of the classroom. They're all gonna get a chance to introduce themselves in a moment, and we're gonna have a really great discussion about this. To really frame the conversation, I wanna talk about what career exploration means and what we mean by that. Career exploration is gaining exposure to careers. It's about finding out about different uh, employers, different industries. It's less about identifying a pathway and following that pathway to next steps. That's kind of like later on on a student's journey, but this is about how do you open the doors of possibility for students. And at ASA, we do this as, as early as sixth grade, and some of our grantees and partners uh, do this even earlier, and we're gonna chat about that as well. So to, to really start this conversation, and this is for everybody to, to answer, and when you answer, if you can just give a quick name, position, organization, you'll have lots of, lots of time to talk really about the work that you do. Um, my first question is, who, whose role is it to bring career exploration to young people? And we'll just go down the line and answer that question. I'll start. I'm JP Michel, the founder at SparkPath. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I think the role uh, comes down to the educator. Uh, I think that they bring the world of work to life uh, for students. I think they bring students' unique contributions to life, and they're a great first person to get the conversation started. I think it's the whole community, everybody in the ecosystem's responsibility, but to your point, it's the educators and the schools that can be the purveyor of those tools and resources for parents, businesses, and everybody to have those conversations. I'm Taylor Shedd, founder and CEO of Stimuli, and uh, that's a great question, and that's a stumper right there. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and say a different answer that it's innovators' jobs to figure out how we bring career exploration like to kids. Yeah, and I'm John Rathens. Uh, I'm with Partnerships over uh, on our education work at YouTube, and I would say that, you know, from our perspective, we see the students themselves um, being really self-directed in their exploration of careers. Interesting. So we're going to really start about in school first. Um, so over the last uh, few years, ASA has supported a lot of school-based efforts, uh, specifically in uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, where ASA is located, our office is located in Boston, Massachusetts. We've supported uh, 14 different school districts across the Commonwealth who 
either launched or expanded on their own middle grades programs. And through that work came a white paper, which you can find on our website, as well as a practitioner's playbook that has kind of tangible resources for practitioners to take with them, uh, which we've developed through a uh, partnership with the Association for Middle Level Education. Uh, we identified through all of that work, through this grant making, through the, the relationship building we did with educators, we found four really promising models. These are all educator-led models of career exploration, specifically in the middle grades, but we see that some of that expansion into high school as well. So the first is a whole school embedded approach that incorporates a lot of community connections. So some school districts actually just reinvented what their school day-to-day -day looks like. Uh, and really thought about what that looks like in the classroom, but then how do you bring more professionals to the skill, school building? The second is specifically STEM programming. Usually when we talk about career exploration, you experience that in a school district, a lot of the times it's STEM focused. Um, and this can be done through a variety of ways, but we've noticed it, that it can be done through having a dedicated maker space. So really hands-on experiential opportunities for students to build and explore, create prototypes, do shark stink tile, shark stink Shark Tank style, that's a tongue twister, um, to professionals to, to get their feedback. Uh, the third is district level Im implementation of project-based learning. So this can be uh, cross-curricular, across different subjects, having students develop kind of projects. And then the fourth is creating ex engineering exploration opportunities for students. So kind of continuing that building and incorporating that, but across different school subject areas as well. And so my first question um, on this topic goes to David. So in our work with AMLE specifically, Cajon Valley wrote a case study that's in the playbook. Um, what, which of those four models does Cajon Valley uh, kind of use or, or, and how, what does that look like in the district? How early do you reach students? When we began with you and we first got the grant from ASA to scale up, it was all experiential based. We built. Uh, career explorations for our kids starting in kindergarten. At a minimum, kindergar kindergarten students will experience six careers through project-based learning that we developed with resources. First grade, it's another six. So by the time a kid leaves middle school, they've experienced a minimum of 54 deep career explorations. It was all experiential, teacher-led. But since then, we've licensed our intellectual property to Saki Dodelson, CEO of Beable, former creator of Achieve 3000, and we built it into a technology that is now scalable to everyone. So it's teacher-led, computer-facilitated, and now that we've built a high school, we started a high school last year, and now have juniors this year, it's student-led. So we've kind of created the whole ecosystem um, in iteration. I think that's really phenomenal to think about the, incorporating both the educator-led piece, which is really important for educators to have that buy-in, right? And to really understand the topic and have that kind of foundational knowledge, but then bringing that student piece and giving students voice within the classroom and in the school district, is, I think is really brilliant. Um, and as we were talking about stakeholders, right, whose role is it? Kind of a follow-up question to this. How does Cajon Valley uh, have relationships? You mentioned Beable, but what other community relationships have you developed over, over time? Before we invested million dollars into the creation of our solution, we invited the Chamber of Commerce, we invited people from the Department of Defense, our local fire chief, police chief, city manager, into a room with our board members and asked the question, is this needed? And everybody said, yes, please stop stigmatizing the most important work in our country, which is the hands-on doers and the realistic people in the military and local developers here in East County. And then the need for skilled workers. Everyone has a need for workers, and we're not preparing kids for jobs right in their backyard. So everyone said yes, we went all in, and our curriculum is based on our local businesses and community, and the Meta Pro is everybody in our ecosystem, including the parents. That's amazing. Uh, so JP, Spark Path uses uh, like challenge-based work to have students learn about careers. Can you uh, expand on that, how challenges are used? Sure, I really admire the work, David, that you've built to bring careers to life in schools. Let's imagine a student who hasn't had the privilege to come to your school. So if you can all, for a moment, put yourself in the shoes of a 16-year-old. Her name is Anna, and she's being asked the big question. What do you want to be when you grow up? And in her mind, that's a difficult question to answer because she only knows about 10, 20, or 30 job titles, and there's over 20,000 of them in the world. They're changing all the time. Some of them don't even exist yet. 
So it's really hard. She's in a tough spot. What I ask students like Anna when I work with them is, what if instead of choosing a job title, you picked a problem to solve? That's what I mean by challenge. So a challenge could be improving mental health or increasing sustainable energy. Once Anna picks something that's motivating for her, then she can work backwards. What companies are increasing sustainable energy in my city? Who works there and what did they have to learn to be able to do that? So it starts with challenges first and then students like Anna get to reverse engineer it. And this really flips the model because typically Anna would look at it the other way. What's my favorite class? What can I study in post-secondary related to that? Hopefully someone hires me and then later down the line you find out what am I really doing? What's the problem I'm solving? And maybe you hate it or maybe you love it. And my invitation is let's start with challenges first. It's really interesting. And so, and that's something we have learned over time too at ASA, what challenge-based work lo looks like. We've done uh, a number of different challenges and there's a lot of buy-in from students to be able to have that kind of empowerment over their own learning. Uh, this week, we were excited to announce our latest digital uh, platform, which is called Evolve Me and incorporates a lot of really interesting uh, technology partners, and some of that is really challenge-based work that students can do directly on their on their phones, which is where we're going to pivot to right now. Um, so we have this this school-based work that's happening, and we could say school-based or the out-of-school time programs as well, right? Led by practitioners, and then we have uh, technology companies here. We are ASU GSV. There are many ed tech companies here, thinking about what that looks like outside the classroom as well. And so uh, through our own research, we learned that the majority of Gen Z students think that there's a lot of value to that technology-based learning, especially video games. Many think that video games can help them learn about collaboration, problem solving, decision making. So we're hearing from young people that this is what they want. And so my next question uh, goes to John. So YouTube has been a major player in technology for for years and years, um, and has, re has really worked in this kind of career exploration space. Um, can you expand on that and share a little bit more about that? Yeah, happy to do so. So um, YouTube, might have heard of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a platform with you know, 2 billion users, 92% of which um, are using it to access information. And we know that 93% um, of 18 to 24 year olds use it to learn something. Um, so this is something that we've known on uh, about the platform for a long time. Um, and you know what are what are folks learning? They're learning all kinds of things, uh, but they're getting inspired. And so they'll watch uh, Marcus Brownlee video about technology, or Simone Geertz talk about engineering, or a Veritas video about physics. And so they get inspired. Um, and you know, we love the stories that we hear. You may have heard of Josh Carroll, who looked, taught himself physics watching uh, YouTube and then you know, became a, 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 a physics uh, major. The thing, though, is that those are kind of serendipitous. And so the work that we've done recently um, with ASU is really develop a path from an informal kind of inspirational learning to a more formal experience. And so we call that study hall. Um, we've worked alongside um, ASU and our great partner, uh, Crash Course. Um, and what we did there is we created kind of three types of content. The first type is called How to College. And How to College is answering all those questions that you know, young people who don't have parents who went to college, what, what do they need to know, right? So kind of making sure we bring that equity piece so that everyone around the world can get really high quality college counseling. Um, the second piece, speaking about career, is called Fast Guides. And what that has to do with is, okay, if I want to study a given topic in college, what exactly does that enable me to do? What's the job? What am I going to study? And then what am I going to do? And then the third piece is some foundational courses that we have, uh, four foundational courses we've worked on with ASU that enable someone to take that first step so that they can, for very low cost, $25, sign up, and then be in a public university course. Um, and if they want to keep the credit and they want to they want to pay for the credit because they like their grade, then they pay $400 and they get ASU public university credit that's transferable anywhere ASU credits are accepted. So that's kind of the the scale that we are thinking at, and also kind of a little bit about the program that we put together. Uh, so Taylor, Stemuli is a really 
interesting, innovative kind of gaming platform that's at the intersection of AI, workforce development, and education. It was really born from this understanding of lack of student engagement in the classroom, which uh, many of us have experienced over, especially over the last number of years as we've kind of toggled between hybrid, virtual, in-person um, in response to the pandemic. How does Stimuli kind of mediate that student engagement piece? And does this happen in or out of the classroom? What, is, what does that look like? Um, well, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so Stimuli, you know, uh, if I tell you how it started, it will make sense as how we're using it inside and outside of the classroom. But the long story short is we were initially connecting high school students to Fortune 500 company mentors for the Dallas ISD P-TECH program, which is the largest P-TECH implementation in the entire world, 25 high schools, 100 industry partners. And what we recognized in that first rollout and as we expanded is that we were still only grabbing the attention of the top 30% of students who are gonna go to YouTube anyway and figure it out. And so the next question became, how do we engage the entire 100% of students, not just the top 30? Pandemic then happened, and we started working alongside Dallas ISD and Superintendent Inahosa at the time who said, okay, I wanna do something nobody else in the world was doing. I wanna build school in a video game. I wanna make it so educational that when it's time to come to dinner, the parents are pulling their kids from their education in order to get them at the dinner table. Most of the time I talk about that, everybody starts laughing. I'm like, why are you laughing? Because we know it's not happening today. Um, with that said, as far as the investment that we're making at Stimuli and how this is done, is we do not believe that you can leave career exploration for outside of the classroom only. We don't believe you can leave it for in the classroom only. We believe you have to do both. And I'll talk about what that could look like. One, the game needs to be so educational, uh, excuse me, it needs to be so fun that it doesn't matter how long the student is playing it, that they're invested in playing this game for 10 years just like our kids have been playing The Sims, Fortnite, and Minecraft for tens of years. The next thing that needs to happen is there has to be an intersection of what you're learning in the classroom, let's call it mathematics, and your future career. So imagine on the Stimuli platform, your student in math trying to get to pass Algebra 1 by eighth grade, which we believe is extremely important, and you're told to go into your Stimuli nav and universe, and you're gonna go into a lab environment and interact with three avatars, one, your principal investigator, two, your competitive peer, and three, your postdoc student. So imagine these students are learning about multiplying and dividing exponents because they step into a lab environment where a black woman is the principal investigator telling them that we're gonna do cellular division by creating new food cells. And they're sitting at a lab bench with a pipette and all of the different 21st century technologies and all of these labs that they've never been exposed to before. And in the classroom, they're learning human durable skills, because they're interacting with these three random avatars who have all crazy fun personalities. Two, they're getting exposed to workplace environments. But three, the most important thing is they're finally learning math. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so here, now we have this dichotomy, right? In and out of the, in and out of the classroom that we're talking about. Uh, David and JP, what are some of the challenges that schools are facing when it comes to career exploration in middle and high school specifically? Well, for us, it didn't exist before we started it, so I think that's a barrier. Um, but what we learned from research is kids foreclose on careers and start to foreclose on different ideas as early as seven years old. That research came out of the OECD. And so if we don't expose kids to careers early and often and start building self-awareness, that's the biggest piece. When people meet our students, our students can tell you, I'm artistic and social investigative. That means I like to use math and science. I like to solve problems. And I want every day to look different. And by the way, I'm a first grader. <laughs> and so when I didn't know what a civil engineer was actually until I watched our first grade teachers teach that unit. And the first graders had to build a city and pitch to the city manager who comes to the classroom and listens to their ideas on where they should place the new things in the city. It's like, oh, that's what a civil engineer does. First graders told me that. But I think that the barrier is it doesn't exist in most places and people don't see it's possible. The other thing is it's not one more thing on the teacher's plate. It contextualizes everything they're doing in the classroom around reading, math, writing, science, and, and the world. So. 
the schools that are using this challenge mindset, they're thinking about equity, specifically because they're focused on helping students who might not have been exposed to different careers and opportunities uh, than others would have. So you're thinking about someone from maybe a marginalized group, someone from any uh, op oppressed background. Have they seen what careers are available or only a small fraction? If we start the process by asking them, tell me what you like based on what you already know, we're doubling down on where they've been instead of where they're trying to go. That's the opposite of equity. So it's very important that at these young ages, uh, young ages, we focus on exploration. And these are the things that we're highlighting. It's not about decision-making certainty, which academically, for a long time, that has been a pillar of success of career development, occupational certainty. It's not true anymore. We're preparing these kids for 50, 60, or 70-year careers we anticipate that things will change along that way. So they need to be equipped with a new mindset to navigate those changes, right? They're not gonna be locked in to one job title forever. Uh, and if they have that impression, then we're holding them back. It's really interesting. And that makes me think about the challenge that educators face, where many are career educators, right? Who are in the classroom for a really long time. and. Um, kind of gaining that understanding of like what industries are out there. One of the partner school districts we work with uh, in the Taunton area of Massachusetts, Taunton School District, actually have educators go out to employers and learn about the different experiences. And so they get that kind of professional development piece to kind of bring that in to, to learn about the future of the workforce, because it really is so different from when we were in school. So providing that additional professional development really helps kind of mediate that piece as well. Um, Taylor and John, I'm gonna give you that same question. What are the, the challenges for kind of direct to kid kind of digital initiatives? So I'm gonna get a little squishy for a minute, because I used to teach fifth grade, um, and, and so have a lot of, um, personal work that I've done in, the, in this space as well. I think that um, there's programs, there's technology, there's platforms, there's all this stuff. But really fundamentally what we're working with here is three things. The curiosity of students, their passion for learning and for, the, for growing themselves, and the relationships that power the, their exploration. So I think at the beginning of the panel, we kind of all had our kind of lane and we did a good job of sticking to our lanes. But I really think that um, the, the big challenge is how do you meet students where they are? Um, how do you help them find their way, whether it be a district program or you know programs like Spark Path or Stimuli? And then how do you um, surround them with relationships that are supportive? of that. So in the case of YouTube and our partners at ASU and Crash Course are both organizations that have a lot of experience in edu online educational communities and what it takes to like build a, um, a healthy and supportive environment online and then transferring that into an educational experience. So I think that really all of us in a different ways with, with different tools are trying to help students navigate um, their curiosity, their passion and relationships. And the question is what challenges students face? Yeah, this is a big question. I mean, I would start, it's well beyond the education system, the challenges that we're facing in engaging our students. And what I mean by that is um, we're developing an educational video game. We have, we're a venture-backed company. And what's the first thing any venture capitalist asks you? Like, where are you focused? Are you focused on this one thing that you're focused on? You need to do fifth grade math really well, and then we'll think that you can do something else. Our kids don't need that. Our kids need a serious investment in building a video game that's like Call of Duty or Fortnite or Minecraft, and that costs, if not $15 million, hundreds of millions of dollars to produce, and unfortunately, we don't have the flow of funds yet that have said, we're gonna invest in you going ahead and building this video game that's on the same stand, you know, standard as Fortnite. So the first thing I would say is there's a lot of adults that think they know what's best for kids, but the video games have shown us what kids want and the returns that the video games have have shown us that they're, you know, they're gonna continue to invest in it, they're gonna continue to figure out how to spend their parents' money to invest in it, right? <laughs> um, so that's the first thing I would say is just the flow of capital into this industry and into this conversation is so focused on what has always worked in the past. I would argue that it, whatever we're doing has not worked really well if, the, if it's so siloed as far as success. 
So if the way we've built products in the past has been focused on core academics here, and then you've got your supplemental collab going over here, great. And then if your workplace learning, how do you sell it? You know, there's all the questions. We're asking ourselves all the wrong questions. Um, so with that said, I mean, I think the hope for the future is that students understand video games, students understand YouTube. And you know, when I think about discovery, because that's what our conversation is about today, career discovery is your opportunity to inspire. When I think about a learner in the K through 12 uh, ecosystem, what I would argue, and it's not me saying it to be mean to anybody, but based upon the results, is our kids are not engaged and inspired in math and reading. They're barely engaged and even coming to school when we look at chronic ab absenteeism, right? And so the challenge that we have to solve for our students is how do we inspire them to get them re-engaged back in the K through 12 ecosystem? And inspiration isn't, come to class today, I'm gonna teach you how to do the Pythagorean theorem, right? It's not. Um, so that's, that's the challenge is like the flow of capital, one, two, we need to like blow up all the rules on you're supposed to only stay here and focus in this lane and that's not what we're doing at Stimuli. And then the third thing, um, you know, with the video game and meeting learners where they are, we have to bring in cultural relevance, right? And so all of us are so focused, I'm focused on, I want all the kids in low income communities to be on high wage, high demand job. That's important. But sometimes again, we get so siloed to say a high demand job is in technology or green tech. But why can't we explain to a kid that, hey, why don't you figure out how to develop Olympic uniforms that we can recycle every year as opposed to everybody spending so much money on and they're like thinking, connecting their passion to fashion and sports with renewable energy. Those are the types of things we need to be thinking about. And so the challenge for the students is our mindset is what the challenge for the students is. You guys are making these segues into questions super easy right here because Taylor, you were talking about um, making things relevant for young people. So. And that's so incredibly important for, for a student to learn about something, be interested in it, but then also learn about if they like it or if they don't, because there's just as much value in saying, I really am not interested in that, right? How are each of your organizations staying relevant for young people and kind of keeping up with what Gen Z and then eventually Gen Alpha will, will want? Well, my st story is that I, I started doing career coaching myself, one-on-one -on -one with students, and I had a huge problem. They were all obsessed with job titles. They thought they had to pick one, so I created a tool called the Challenge Cards to help them navigate that. So it was about showing them inspiring challenges to solve instead of job titles to fit into. So that started in 2017 with 25 challenges. And since then, through feedback from educators and students themselves, that deck of cards has evolved. We've got 53 challenges now, and the goal was to have a representative sample of what speaks to students. And what I quickly realized from making that tool was that I couldn't pretend to make the dictionary of challenges that exist in the world. There's no such thing. I just needed the best way to inspire students to see the world that way so that they could now identify all the challenges that they see in their environments, and that's really the goal. We've moved the goalpost back a little bit. So the first half of my career I spent as a principal and assistant soup in No Child Left Behind. Literally, my job was to improve test scores. Yeah. That's it, and that's all we focused on. And we saw kids drop out and get pregnant in high school and go into generational gangs in low-income communities. We didn't change anything, even though we improved the test scores. So our vision is happy kids, healthy relationships on a path to gainful employment. That's our vision statement that, are, that is above our boardroom. Happy kids isn't fluffy. Happy is self-awareness, self-love, self-esteem. We develop that. Healthy relationships, building relationships between peers where everybody knows everybody's story, but there's adults connected through career exploration to build a network for kids to have access to when they're ready to start thinking about things in high school. And path to gainful employment is every grade, every year, career exposure, experience, and self-reflection, does that feel like me or does that not feel like me? Like 90% of kids in fourth grade want to be a veterinarian until they do the veterinarian unit. And they realize that's an investigative, realistic career. I don't want to do those things to animals. But animal trainer, dog therapy, you know, horse therapy, there's lots of other things that you could do if you like animals. These are the conversations we're able to have with our kids that they might not have at home, especially in low-income families. 
Um, at Stimuli, we take every learner through the discover, train, and work experience, and built into the discover experience is a conversation that the student has with one of our cool avatars in order to understand what their interests are and their passions, and basically what we're doing is taking somebody that might say their passion is in beauty, we might say, well, did you know you can work for Sephora as a data analyst? And so just bridging that connection between Again, the inspiration of like, here's what you're really excited about, but here's what's possible for you in the area that you're excited about. So that's one answer to the question. I think the second answer to the question gets really at the heart of like, how do we build and develop products? Um, so we work with so many innovative school models across the country that are serving a very diverse group of students. And the purpose of that is, is all of us are diverse. Like we couldn't raise our hand in this room and figure out all the diversities that we have. Um, but the bottom line of what I'm saying is I believe school systems and educators and local communities understand their learners way better than we ever could at Stimuli. And so our number one goal is attracting really great partners, serving distinct learners, like learners with autism, Arizona Autism Charter Schools, Louisiana Key Academy serving learners with dyslexia, Chicago scholars serving high-performing, under-resourced students in Chicago. I don't know all of these areas, but what I do know is I can hire the best talent in the world I can have conversations with my partners to understand what personalized assets they want to bring to this video game. And you would be surprised how easy it is to build a Chicago Bean right within a video game. It's very easy. So the relevance is coming, again, through, one, undercovering a student's passion and connecting them to the idea that they can be in a career they're passionate in technology. Two is working with the researchers and the local education providers to make sure that we're tailoring our services towards what those communities need, not what we think they need. And then three is just trying to continue to attract the best talent we can in the world so that we can be the engineers for educators because David is never gonna go and hire a Unity development team to do all the crazy things that we have to figure out how to do at Stimuli. So, you know, staying relevant is core to YouTube, you know, what YouTube has to do as a, as a platform. Um, I think, you know, fundamentally we connect people with the content that they love to watch. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the really wonderful things to get to do this kind of work at YouTube is, you know, there are niches for all kinds of different uh, content from all over the world. People all over the world are learning on YouTube in their own language um, about the topics that are important to them. Um, and young people are constantly discovering new sources of inspiration and new creators uh, who inspire them. So in some ways, that, that part of the work is the work that our creator community does and that we work hard every day to, to support. Um, some of the things that we are doing at YouTube in addition to great partnerships, like the study hall partnership that I shared with, uh, about is, you know, developing uh, better tools on the platform for learners to learn from. So we've launched a, a courses product to help people kind of learn in a more structured format on the platform. We try to meet students not only where they are on the platform, but students and teachers where they are in the ed tech apps that they use we, through the Player for Education, where we show up in a responsible way with no ads and no link backs. But again, all of this is about staying relevant because um, the creators on our platform are reaching our audience in a way that um, really speaks to them and ignites their curiosity, their passion, and they feel that they have a relationship to those creators. So we can see the value here in, in both models, this in-school, out-of-school kind of dynamic here. Um, but then ultimately the question comes to access. How do we ensure that students have access to all of these resources? And so that leads us to this conversation about scalability. And not only like scaling to reach more students, but then also how do you have a deep impact for those students? How are each of your organizations tackling scalability and an impact for students? You're, you're the scale. I, I think we have scale. <laughs> uh, Teach us. But, but I think, um, I, I say that humbly, but I think like the scale piece is, is, is there. I think the impact piece is really where we're investing, um, at least for ourselves. And again, I don't, I don't mean to be repeating too much, but that's where the work with ASU, you know, is really a, we're taking a step forward towards saying like, hey, you know, in six or seven clicks, you can be taking a college course from ASU, which is something that in higher education is, is pretty unique. Um, and so, um, 
I think that that's really the, the area where we're focused is, you know, the mission of our team is uh, to make sure that we are reducing barriers to high quality education and taking our billions of, of users and helping them learn together. Go ahead. For scalability, what we're working on now and what um, we're getting funding for, Chan Zuckerberg just gave us 1.2 million to build a data system to start measuring the, the efficacy of the programs. But if we can change the data conversation away from test scores in language arts, math, and science, which is what all states are measured on now, to vocational identity, self-awareness, relationships and network, and then possible future selves that we build through the vocational identity, and measure those and show that those things are actually leading into return on investment into careers and gainful employment, financial freedom, all the things we want, then we can change the conversation. So I think data and visual, visual, visualization of that data and measurement is important. Next step. On the stimuli side, uh, this is an interesting question. Um, you know, we have aspirations to be the educational metaverse of metaverses, and we have aspirations to use our navigator toolkit as a data mesh that's blanketed across YouTube, Roblox, Fortnite, all the places our kids are spending their time in. And so as far as how we scale impact, I think it's two ways. Like one, you have to think about who I am and the impact that needs to happen in my individual community. I care about everybody, but I can't leave my community behind. And so as far as how we're thinking of scaling impact, um, we work with the partners that have the largest amount of reach in the world is really one, how we get to scale, how we get to impact is taking my lived experience and the lived experience of the people that are around us at Stimuli that is highly diverse and ensuring that we're not creating bias in these new technologies that we're building. So as we experiment with generative AI and we're doing different things, we all have heard about bias in AI. I'm putting people like myself all across the product to ensure that we're not developing a product that's recreating everything that we've already created. And then I think the last thing about impact is it is so important for the world to see me, right? It's important for the world to see now the five other folks on my leadership team that look and feel like me. And we have to be able to say that. So as far as scaling impact, we're partnering with the largest, uh, most impactful companies in the world. We're hiring highly diverse talent that has lived experience that we're trying to solve for ourselves. And then three, it's just dedication, being daring, and being committed because it's hard. Less than 1% of black females get venture capital funding. I'm the 94th black woman in the history of the world to raise over a million dollars worth of capital. And I've told you I need to raise like 50 to 100 million in order to build the educational metaverse of metaverses. So that means that we have to have a little bit of chips on our shoulders to say, even though the world is stacked against us and having the capital that we need in order to do what we're gonna do, we're gonna do it. I love your energy. Every time you stop talking, I wanted to clap, so I'm glad everybody clapped this time. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Half of the partners that use the challenge mindset are in higher ed, and they care about scalability. Some of them are in the room here. Put yourself in their shoes. There are five people that have to do career exploration for 50,000 students. So the days of having one-on-one -on -one appointments all day, every day are over. It's not even possible with those numbers. So the most innovative institutions I'm seeing, they have a plan for scale. They're being very creative. They're embedding career conversations in the classroom. They're doing workshops. They're doing career fairs. Some of the schools are doing uh, career conversations with every incoming first year students. That's 7,000 students. So they think about scale. They're trying to bring career exploration to life in a new way. And there's some great early success there. So we're going to sum up this, this conversation and finish this up here. Thank you to for everyone who, is, who attended. Thank you to our amazing panelists. I'm going to finish this up with one really quick question. Um, in or out of the classroom, or both, is it teacher-led? Is it Gen Z-led? We're just going to go down the line, and we'd love to hear your perspective. Easy answer is both. Uh, you know, we plant the seed while they're in school, but they're going to work 50, 60 years. A lot of learning will happen then. We just want to on them, onboard them onto a great start. Both. Both. Yes. <laughs> so there you have it, have it, everyone. Thank you so much for attending.